Good morning, everybody. Welcome to CS202 Online, video five. So today we are changing gears from what we've been talking about for the past few days as we start talking about pointers. So that's kind of like phase two of the class. Phase one was talking about classes and object-oriented programming, and it's not, not everything. We haven't covered just about everything. We are now going to uh, talk about pointers because after we learn about that, we are going to revisit uh, classes. And even today, uh, when I talk about the arrow operator, I will be revisiting classes. So we're not done with classes, but we're switching gears. So um, hope you guys are all here. No, no one's saying anything, but I do see that we have some viewers. So I guess there's people here live. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So. Uh, by the way, check the due date on the assignments. It's now on uh, Saturday, so it was moved from I think Thursday to Saturday. So uh, just keep up to date on that on campus. Huh? Why is that zoomed in? There we go. Okay. So this time I have actually like lecture notes for this, just to to be to be as clear as possible with pointers, because it turns out that pointers is something that a lot of people freak out about when they first uh, start using them. And it's not necessarily that it's hard. The problem with the pointers that people have a hard time with is because if you know if you screw up a normal variable, the worst that could happen is you get a wrong answer. You know, you try to store something that's like a 5.9 in an integer, and it just sort of a five, right? And you and then you do like 5.9 plus like um, 0.9. And you expect to get something on the order of six point something, but you end up getting five because they're two integers, for example. And so there you see you, you see an error in the output, and then you figure out, oh, I should have kept it as a double or, or a float. That's the end of the story. With pointers, on the other hand, when you get an error with a pointer, you typically end up crashing the program. And we'll find, we'll talk about why in a second here. But because of that. Uh, it, it's very sort of disconcerting and scary when you run your program and it just crashes and nothing happens. And so that's what really scares people with pointers is the, that the stakes are higher for errors. Here, it's not just like you're just going to get a like semantic error or something is just going to print wrong. No, with pointers typically, well, that can happen too. Uh, what will most likely happen if you screw up a pointer is your program will crash. And then people just like freak out because, I mean, when your program crashes, you're like, you have no idea where it crashed or what happened. And, and so that's the other part of where I'm going to try to talk to you later on about how to approach those issues. But first, let's just talk about what a pointer is. And so I want to start by first just telling you the uh, definition of a pointer. And then from there, I will actually explain what it really means. So first, let's talk about syntax. How do you declare a pointer? Now, a pointer is just a type of a variable. There's integer variables. There's double variables, there's floats, there's cars, and there is also pointer variables. So the way you declare a pointer is the syntax for that is going to be data type and then the asterisk, which stands for pointer, and then an identifier, and then your semicolon. And so what do we call that asterisk? That asterisk is actually called the dereferencing operator or also the indirect operator. So the asterisk is called the dereferencing operator or also the indirect Operator. And depending on uh, who, what, where you took 135, they might have covered a little bit about pointers at the end of the semester. Um, I know in the summer I covered a little bit, I think. I can't remember. But uh, that's okay. We're kind of treating it as if it's a brand new topic. We're not expecting you to know anything about them. Also, forewarning, I do like to mess up my asterisks and sometimes I do them like that or some weird thing. I don't know. So just FYI. Um, and so, what does this mean? Well, let me let me give you a quick example about 
what this would look like. So a data type is going to be the type that the pointer is pointing to. So for example, suppose that we want to make an integer pointer. You would put int, then the dereference operator, and then an identifier, which is just a variable name, so like ptr. So here, what I've done is I've created a pointer that is called ptr, but here's the thing about pointers. In C++, you need to tell the, comp the, the, the operating system what type of pointer you're making. Or actually, I think you can tell the compiler too, technically. So you basically got to tell it what you're going to be normally pointing to. So for example, if you want to point to an integer, then you make it an integer pointer. If you want to point to a character, you made a character pointer. So this might give you a hint as to what a pointer is. So before I, I, I flat out just tell you, let's think about how things are stored in memory, like physically. So normally, when you declare a, like a, a normal variable, like an integer, you say something like int a. And maybe you also initialize it. You may not. It's optional, but you could do that, right? So when you do this, what is happening is somewhere in memory, when your program is running, the operating the, the, the program tells the operating system, like, hey, I need to store an integer. First of all, the operating system has a little chart somewhere um, that, uh, no, actually, that would be... Hmm, I'm trying to decide if it's the operating system or the, or the uh, assembly file which will contain the size. We'll, we'll go with operating system, I think. Yeah, operating system. So the operating system somewhere has a chart that says how much space it needs to store an integer. Okay? And that's in terms of bytes. Just as a refresher, uh, there's eight bits in a byte. And so that means like a combination of zeros and ones in binary. So like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So th that would be eight bits, which would also be considered one byte, okay? Turns out that in most computers, an integer is actually four bytes, which would be four times eight, 32, right? For a second, I was like, it should be 32, but I was thinking of 28 for some reason. I was like, that's not right. But yeah, so an integer can be stored in 32 bits, also known as four bytes. This is dependent on, on specific on the on the system architecture and the uh, operating system itself. Some computers, like old school computers, could store it in two bytes. Maybe some big computers could store it in eight bytes. You know, it's it, it's really dependent on, on the system itself. But what your program tells the computer is, I need to have allocated somewhere in your main memory, so that's the RAM, a slot for an integer. And then it looks and it says, well, an integer in this system, it takes four bytes. So somewhere in memory, which I'm going to typically represent as a long stick like this, somewhere in memory here, it's going to get a little slice of this. And that little slice is going to be used to store the integer. Okay. And, and this, the way that this, this is actually stored in memory it's not, it, it, you could think of it like an array where it's like slot zero, slot one, slot two, slot three, slot four, but it doesn't use uh, decimals for that. It actually uses hexadecimals, which is just another way of using basically binary. But uh, typically when you see addresses represented in the computer, they're printed as hexadecimal addresses, just so we don't get such a huge, huge number that's just binary. Because otherwise, when you print it out an address of, of a specific variable it would literally be 32 zeros and ones or potentially 64 zeros and ones if you have a 64-bit system or, or at least the addresses and so that would be very annoying to look at those really big numbers because the fact of the matter is that there's tons and tons and tons of addresses in main memory how, how many addresses are there in main memory this is a 219 thing so you will learn about this in 219 i have i have my videos for the summer for 219 if you want to look ahead you can check those out but as a quick summary of that, because you don't really need to know too much about the internals of how that works, is it turns out that most of the times the memory is split into four byte increments. And so the reality of this is that each of these has four slots like that. And so this is byte zero, well, it depends, start kind of from zero, oh, one, byte zero, byte one, byte two, byte three, 
that's the first row and then four five six seven eight nine ten eleven and so on and so when you're storing something we will consider this to be address zero and typically in hexadecimal um, just as a refresher I hope you guys know what hexadecimal is um, it's base 16 counting so normally as humans we like to use base 10 we start from zero and we go all the way to nine and after that we basically repeat them by combining multiple digits together so like 10 which is the number after nine is a combination of the, the first two digits right the zero and the one and then from there you just start replacing this least significant digit with any of these and eventually when you get to 19 then it replaces the next available significant digit. An easier way to see this is if you start out from zero, zero. You can see that this, this would be the least significant digit and when it gets, it gets to nine, this goes up by one and so on, okay? So base 16 goes from zero technically to 15. However, the fact that it's base 16, which again is hexadecimal, means that you actually need hexadecimal potentially 16 different symbols to represent hexadecimal uh, numbers. So normally with base 10, we have, we have basically 10 symbols, right? We have the zero, the one, the two, the three, the four, the five, the six, the seven, the eight, the nine. They're all symbols. They're all essentially just squiggly lines. Like this, is, this, this little squiggly line that looks kind of like an S turns out that it's the representation of the number five. And then this squiggly line here that looks like a little circle and a stick turns out to be the representation of a nine, right? And so when we're doing hexadecimal, we need more symbols uh, because we need 16 of them. And so it turns out that to make our life easy, the, the numbers zero through nine are kept the same, but we can't use 10 like we would in normal, in normal uh, decimal because it's a combination of digits. We want a unique digit for 10. And so while I could invent and be like, okay, that's that's going to be my 10 and maybe like this is my 11 or something and just come up with weird symbols it turns out that uh, we just kind of look at the alphabet and use those for the rest of the symbols so you use a b c d e and f okay because that would be 10 11 12 13 14 and 15. again it's base 16 which means you go you have 16 digits but you only go up to 15 because of the zero that counts as a digit as well just like how with base 10, you only go up to nine because that's technically 10 digits because of the zero. And so if you're trying to represent the number 16 in hexadecimal, it turns out that it is just one zero. Now, why one zero? Because the same thing, when, when, you, when, you, when you have two digit things, you start from zero, zero, you go all the way to zero, nine, then 0a, 0b, eventually you get to 0f, and then just like with the, with the 0, 0 with decimal, when you get to 9, it increases the next significant digit, it increases this to 1. So then you get to 1, 0. And then from there you go all the way to 1, 9, and then 1a, 1b, all the way onto 1f, and then from there you're going to go into 2a, okay? So it might get a little, might take a little getting used to if you never, if you don't use this a lot. Um, but why am I going all over this? Because it turns out that these addresses are kept in hexadecimal. And so when you want to look at where you're physically storing information and you try to ask the computer to print it, it's gonna print it in hexadecimal. So I want you to be aware of that, okay? And we'll see that when we start actually running some code here. So anyways, back to the addresses. Uh, typically when it's hexadecimal, you will see a zero X in front of an address. And that's because it's sort of the symbol to you to figure out that that's actually hex. Because remember, if you see something like one zero and you don't know if this is hexadecimal, binary or decimal, like it could be different numbers. Like what would that be if it was binary? If that wasn't binary, that actually would turn out to be a two, right? Because zero, zero, and then zero, one, and then one zero. So that's basically a two. So a one zero together could be a two it could also be a 10 in decimal. It could also be a 16 in hexadecimal. So there's a lot of different values that the symbol one and zero together represent, depending on the base of the system. So for the computer to make it clear whether it's printing something out in decimal, binary, or hexadecimal, 
it turns out that it will always add a zero x in front of it. So if you see a zero x one zero, that's not a 10, that's not a two in binary. It turns out it's a hexadecimal one zero, which would be a 16 in decimal, if you were to convert it, okay? You wouldn't call it 16, you'd call it some weird thing. I mean, yeah, you'd call it 16, but if, if we lived in a hexadecimal world, I'm sure we would call it something else, like, cause it, it's, a, it's sort of a basic number. So yeah. No, because 16 sounds like 16, 610, you know? So you call it probably like one, one teen maybe? I don't know. But anyways, back to this. So when your, when your program says, hey, computer, I need to store an integer, it goes in into the memory and on the available memory, it doesn't have, it does, it's not really uh, limited to a certain area of the memory. It pretty much looks at a big chunk of the memory and will randomly, depending on whatever way it decides to assign memory, but most of the time just randomly pick from memory a address. And that address is going to contain four bits, four bytes, which is what you need for your integer. So let's say that it picks this address right here, okay? So what it turns out is that you as a programmer, when you went ahead and declared int a equals five, it goes in here and stores a five. It, it actually stores it in binary. So whatever this is in binary and those 32 bits, it would set them pretty much all to zero, except for like the last three, three digits. It would be like zero, 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 blah, blah, blah. And eventually it would get to one, zero, um, that would be a four. So this would be a five, I think. Yeah. Because one, one would be three. Yeah, yeah. So that would be five in binary. Okay. And so that's what's physically stored here, but you don't need to see this whole address mess. You just see an A. And internally, the A is the representation of that address. And it's good that you're not seeing an address here because every time you run a program, you might get a completely different address. Like next time I run the program, it might decide to give me like an address that's on here like zero address 100, which is not address 100. It's technically whatever this is in hexadecimal, which would be um, um, 16 to the power of three, I think or no, 16 squared, I think. That would be whatever that address is, basically. Because you'd have to run 16 times the 16. So I think 16 squared would be that address in decimal. But yeah, so you would get this address that time you run the program. And the next time you run the program, you might get address three again. You, you don't know. So the, the point is that you don't need to know because all you know is that it's called A. And internally, A will link you to that spot in memory. That's how variables have worked so far in your programs. Pointer variables are going to allow you to take control of the addressing in the system. So instead of dealing things directly with a variable, you're gonna to start to deal with the physical addresses themselves. Now, I'm here to warn you that while we are gonna be dealing with the addresses, there's a certain level of abstraction going on between the real address and main memory and what you see in the program. They're called virtual versus physical addressing, and it's a big topic in 370, but it's also talked about a little bit in 219. So uh, what I'm gonna what what I'm gonna be using to explain a couple of days with pointers and addresses, there's, there's a civil, the silver lining there is that um, for all sense and purposes, some of that is not exactly 100% true. It's just what you see versus, it's like the system shows you a nice and happy way of the world, but internally it's not as nice and clean as it looks, okay? But again, you don't have to worry about that. You just worry about what I show you here. And when you get to those classes, then you learn the truth per se, okay? So, uh, okay. So going back to a pointer variable, it turns out that the, the referencing operator refers to the object to which the operand points, okay? So let me go ahead and write that down here. So this guy here, which can also be called a pointer sometimes, uh, but these are better better proper names for it, the referencing operator or indir indirect operator, refers to the object, here let me make sure I'm nice and clear for this, to the object to which The operand, that is the pointer, 
points. I was just thinking while I'm writing this. I think we're in week three now or four. I'm not 100% sure, but if we're in week four, that means we technically only got one more week and then we got the test. So that, if, it, if this is week four, I'm not 100% sure. By the way, you guys are super quiet today, so it's kind of scary. But uh, yeah, so I guess keep track on, on this computer. Let me see. This So this is week four. Okay, so we got technically two more weeks. We have two more weeks after this week, and then we got the test. So, okay. Are we getting a study guide for the test? So I have, um, I have some things that I will publish it's not see I, I i don't know what you would consider a study guide study guide but what i do is I, I i put a list of topics and things you should focus on for the test um i don't know if that's what you would consider a study guide because i mean studying that is not going to help you out it's more of like telling you what to study it's guiding you to study so i guess it's kind of like a study guide so i will post that uh that will be posted basically about two days or three days before once we know what's going to be fully on the test but uh what we'll try to do is i think on the regular semesters we typically have a day of review at least for the first test we usually have a day for review so like um on week seven which would be two weeks from now when we have the test we can do like the review on uh, on like the monday and then you get the test on uh Thursday, technically speaking. So, yes. Um, so, yeah. So, that would be more of a proper study session that you can help you out. And then, of course, you can bring questions as well. Otherwise, I'll just go over topics that I think are useful. So, yes. But anyways, I guess I just, I just felt like it was coming around the corner. But I guess not. We still got two more weeks. So, we're fine. Okay. So, anyways. Coming, coming back to this. So, Let's scroll all the way down here and let's go ahead and just jump right in, okay, into, into making a pointer. So let's go ahead and first just declare a variable into x. Okay, now this variable is of integer type, so it's somewhere in memory. Somewhere in memory has to be stored. It can't just imaginary exist somewhere. It has to be stored somewhere, but we don't know. We don't care, technically speaking. Okay, cool. Next, let's go ahead and create a pointer variable. What kind of pointer are we going to need? Well, we're going to need an integer pointer, OK? And I, again, with C++, you have to tell it what you're pointing to. And back in the C days, because C++ technically is derived from C, you didn't need to do that. You could do a void pointer, which would point to anything. Uh, while you can kind of do that in C++, even though you really shouldn't, um, just be aware, of, be aware of that fact that typically in C++, you, you, you need to know what you're going to be pointing to. So if you want to point to a character and then you want to use the same pointer to point to an integer, you're going to run into a couple of issues potentially. Uh, and it's not a good idea in the first place to do. Okay. But anyways, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So here we got an integer variable and we also got a, a pointer variable of in, and it's an integer pointer. Okay. Now, technically speaking, both of these lines of code are somewhere in memory because pointer variables just like any other kind of variable also need to store in memory so let me go ahead and make a little visual representation again of our main memory okay and i'm just going to randomly pick two addresses and say this is address 100 again i'm calling it 100 but it's technically not 100 because again it's it's hexadecimal and maybe address here 200 okay and it turns out that the operating system decided to tell us that this is where x is stored and this is where p is stored okay now pointer variables again they also have a place that they have to live right now the pointer variable is just garbage because remember when you declare a variable in c plus plus and this is actually the reason why now that you, you kind of see this when you do declare variable c plus plus it's uninitialized there could be garbage there it turns out that main memory recycles itself so like when you do when you stop using a variable it get return it gets returned to the operating system and at that point it can be handed out to anybody else the operating system doesn't do any kind of cleanup to it and that is why sometimes you will get garbage uh, when you get allocated a piece of memory 
And so that's how they're, that's why they always say initialize your variables. Don't assume that it's going to be set to zero, that kind of stuff. This is the why. Okay. So when you do this, you know, we are setting 25 inside of X here, but this has just garbage in it right now because we never initialized it. We'll talk about how to initialize these in a minute with null. Uh, can we initialize it? Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was eventually going to get to that, but yes, you are indeed correct. You can indeed just basically say int t or p or whatever equals null. I was going to get to that. Um, but yes, to answer your question now, yes, you can and you really should. But like we're on page one and that's on page three. So uh, yes, but yeah, you are correct. Okay. So anyways, going back to this, um, what this piece of area, what this section of memory is called, by the way, where you're allocating these variables is called the stack. Okay. Oh, you can't see it because I'm here. The stack. Okay. That's going to come into play in a minute here when we talk about, well, yeah, today probably about dynamic memory allocation because dynamic memory allocation is actually stored in the heap and we'll, we'll discuss that when we get there. But just for now, this section of our main memory, which for some reason, when I think of memory, I think of, of green. Maybe that's because the, uh, the PCV itself is like green. You know, when you think about like a memory stick. So that is that section of the memory is called a stack. Okay. So now that we have a pointer variable, let's make this pointer variable P point to our integer variable X. For that, we're going to need to learn a new operator. Now you have seen this symbol before, but you're going to see it in a different way. Now the ampersand, the ampersand, and I'll finish running this line has multiple usages. Now, don't be surprised that some symbols in C++ have different usages because you already seen this before. An example of that is the plus sign. The plus sign in C++ means addition when it comes to two integers. So if I have two integers like X and X again, because that's an integer. If I go ahead and, and, and do this operation, this is addition. Okay, that's addition. However, if I was to declare a string variable called str, and that said like high in it, and I did str plus symbol str, that's not addition. That's called concatenation. Hopefully you guys all knew that, but if not, good refresher, right? That's concatenation. Concatenation means it's going to take both strings and basically splash them together and make a bigger string. So it's going to say high, high, basically. It would be like, it would literally say high, high like that afterwards. Okay. Other examples of that. Technically speaking, this is a different operator, but it's still the same symbol is something like I plus plus when you're looking at a for loop and you have your post increment operator. This is called post increment. There's also post decrement, which would be like this. And then there's pre order increment or pre just, just not order, just pre increment, which is like that and pre decrement, which is that. Okay. That technically is the same symbol. So do not be surprised that we use one symbol to represent different things. Turns out that the ampersand is used for a couple of things in, in C++. The one that you know so far, or I hope you did, is when you're passing by by uh, by reference. Remember when you have a function? So like, let's say we have a function called int foo, and there's two parameters to that function. There's an x like that, and then there's a y. Remember pass by value versus pass by reference, right? This is passed by value. This on the other hand here is passed by reference, right? And that ampersand is how you know that's passed by reference. What's the difference? Pass by value makes a copy. Pass by reference only makes a copy of a reference, potentially basically saying that, in fact, there's this really cool picture that somebody showed me. Um, they posted it on Discord, so you can go check it out. I wonder if I can, uh, no, nah, that's too much effort. I have to open up Discord and find it. But uh, it's like they have a picture of a cup of coffee. And then pass by value, they, make, they, they literally clone the cup. On the other hand, pass by reference, they're only making a reference to the, the one and only cup. And so they're filling the cups and they would fill on both the reference 
and then the original versus the clone one where it's just complete copy you only fill one of them so anyways the address of operator is the actual name of this which i'll write in a second is uh is also used to pass by reference when functions okay so as i said let me go ahead and put the definition here it turns out that the ampersand symbol eh, good enough is and by the way ampersand is spelled like this so i'm going to write it here ampersand it's also known as the address of operator. Okay. And the definition of that is that it's a unary operator. So kind of like the pre and post increment or the not symbol, which is the exclamation point or um, technically the minus symbol when you're using it like that. And you can even do the plus symbol, although it's quite useless in those scenarios like that. But those are unary operators. And uh, again, the word unary operator stands because there's only one operand for the operator versus binary operator, which means there's two operands for one operator, such as addition or multiplication, or uh, and and or when you're putting it. Oh, by the way, that's another usage of this symbol. When you see something like A and B like that, this is logic, right? This is hopefully a Boolean. This is also another Boolean, and you're ending them together. There's also where you only use one ampersand. I do believe that's bit, that's uh, ending, but like at the bitwise level or something. But yet another example of using the ampersand for something completely unrelated, which is logical and. So uh, again, don't be surprised. We only the reason why they reuse symbols because you might be like, why why reuse symbols when there's so many different symbols in the computer? The answer is simple: keyboards. We want to be able to type code quickly, and we don't want to have a billion different keys in our keyboards. So we have a couple of symbols, you know, basically the numbers one through zero have symbols on top of them. And we pretty much use all of them in C++. Uh, even the hat symbol we use. Yeah. Uh, the pound symbol, oh, that's a good one. In, in C++, I don't remember what the pound symbol. Oh, yeah, we use it with, a, with include IO stream, right? Yeah, yeah, with the includes you use it. And it's also the preprocessor directive symbol, like the fines. So, yeah. Uh, the add symbol, that one I don't know what... what you're using some documentation stuff, but I don't know if in C++ you actually use the at symbol. I'll have, to, I'll have to research that. But pretty much most of the symbols in your keyboard are used. And that's the point. We want to just kind of keep it to those so that you don't have to, like, remember some weird Unicode numbers. Like, I remember, for example, that alt164, I think, that will create an an and yeah, an end with a tilde on top of it. You know? So you people don't want to remember that kind of stuff. You just want to have a key, right? And so that's why we reuse symbols because keyboards, basically. So anyways, uh, the address of operator is a unary operator that returns the address of its operand. So it really is the complement of the dereference operator. Okay, those are the two big operators we're going to talk about today, really. So what this line of code is doing here, this line of code, is it's getting the address where x lives. What do you think that would be? That would be this address. So what is happening in this line of code is essentially it's looking at what in this specific scenario, because again, remember, these addresses change every time the program runs. So in this specific run instance where we have address 100, it is basically getting address 100 and storing it in P. So literally here, instead of having garbage now, is going to be basically the binary representation of address 100, which again, is this is hexadecimal. So whatever that in hex converted to binary is, so hex to binary is what we store there. But for all sense and purposes, I'm just going to put it like that, okay? Because that's really what's being stored. So it's important to understand that line of code. That line of code is taking the address of x and storing it into p. And p is a pointer variable, okay? Because you could technically store this into... If, if, so if I had, a, if I had an, another integer variable like int a, and I could put a instead of p, that could work too. It's just going to keep it as an integer. But there's more to it than that. 
with the pointer variable, the next line of code is going to be kind of where you see the power of that. Let's go ahead and see out P like that. And maybe add an end line at the end. This is the power of pointers right here. Here, I am C outing P, but I'm not just C outing P itself. I have the, the reference operator in it. You see the little asterisk. If I was to just C out P without it, so if I just see out, it just literally said C out P, like if I got rid of this, this would only print out 100. It would, it would print out 0x100. That was all it would print out. Which is cool, because I mean, I can print out the address of where that pointer lives. It's kind of, oh, sorry, where the, where the variable x lives, but it's kind of useless. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Especially because every time I run the program, it'll be a different address. We can test it out in a minute here. But here now, I am using the asterisk in a pointer variable. And when you use the asterisk, which again is called the dereference operator on a pointer variable, as the name implies, and I'll put it here so you remember, the referencing operator here, as this name implies, it dereferences the pointer. Dereferencing a pointer is like the opposite of the address of operator. The address of operator gets you the address of whatever the operand is. So a, a variable, for example. Dereferencing, on the other hand, it takes an address and it goes there. It dereferences it. So what's going to happen in this line of code, and, and, and I know you asked a question, so I'll get to you. What happens in this line of code is, it sees address 100, and then because of the asterisk, it goes to that address and prints what's in that address. So it's literally going to take address 100, go there, and print the contents of that location. So this would actually print out 25. That's important to understand. Now. So it copies the address into the pointer value. That's correct. It copies the address into the pointer variable. Not value, but variable. That's, that's a better term for it. But yes, you are indeed correct. So this, if you were just to say, by the way, see how like that, that would only print out that. And that's basically what you're assigning into P. Okay, um, here, I'll put a comment here, the way I have it in my notes, so that you remember this, stores the address of x in p, okay? Finally, we can go further than this. In addition to just see outing it, let's go ahead and do this line of code. Now, what is this line of code doing? This line of code is assigning 55, but it's not assigning 55 into P because we see the dereference operator, the asterisk. It's actually saying put 55 in wherever P is pointing to. And where is P pointing to? Well, P contains the address 100. When we dereference that, we go up to the 25. So this line of code is actually going to take the 25 and replace it with a 55 because you're assigning 55 to the dereference pointer which is a the address 100 which so what this is doing is you're indirectly and that's why the nickname for the reference pointer is the indirect operator you're indirectly changing the contents of variable x Nowhere in this code do you see x equals something, right? The assignment operator with x. You see x up here. Well, that's a lie because technically you see it up here, right? That's technically x equals. But okay, aside from that, nowhere else in the code do you see x equal to something, right? However, if I go ahead and see out x right now, that's going to print out 55, which is what was changed. So hopefully you start to get a grasp as to why this could be kind of confusing and difficult sometimes. 
because I went ahead and changed the contents of different variables, but not by name. I never said x equals, aside from the beginning part, like let's just like hide that line. I never said x equals to 55. However, x became 55. Why? Because of the pointer. Another nickname for pointer variables is sometimes, or just point the concept of pointers is aliasing. I have now a sort of an alias, right? Because P is technically the same thing as X. They're both pointing to the same location. I change one of them and it changes the other one, right? And so because of that, uh, it's kind of like an alias of X. So how do we feel about that? Questions? Meantime, I'll write a comment here. This is stores, 55. In memory location pointed to by P, which is X. One page done. All right, so that's pretty much the that's it. That's what pointers are. Now you know what pointers are, essentially. I mean, there's more to it, but this is like the heart of it, really. Uh, we have to write the ampersand every time you want to assign an address to the pointer P. Uh, yes, typically, yes. However, what you can also do is if you have two pointers, so like suppose that I have, so new example. Let's say I have in pointer P and I have in pointer PTR. In this scenario, when you have two pointers, you know, there's some code here where you assign them to stuff. Eventually you could do something like PTR gets P and you don't need address of operator because there are two, they're two pointers. So really the only time that you need the address operator is when you want a regular variable and you want to get the address of that to be pointed to, to a, by a pointer, okay? So every time that you want to get the address of a variable and then store it in a pointer, that's when you want to use the address of operator. Basically, the name tells you what it is. When, if you're if you're reading a, if you're reading this line of code, this says, you know, typically the assignment operator here you read as the word gets. You know, so you say p gets, and then this is called the address of operator. So we say p gets the address of x, and that's almost like self-explanatory just by reading it out loud p gets address of x right so that's kind of that and then um this one for example this is called the dereference operator so you say dereference p gets 55 which means dereference p which means get whatever p is pointing to and go there dereference that so when in doubt read it out loud and that can kind of help to clarify some stuff um I guess I'll skip a little bit ahead since since that was brought up before I go here. So let's talk about null since that was brought up earlier. Okay? So important thing, important fact, I suppose. C does not automatically initialize variables. Right? We all know that. Hopefully. If not, now we do. It does not automatically initialize variables. This can be misleading because sometimes when you're working with a debugger or an IDE and you're testing a program, it will initialize things to zero for you. It's like friendly. It's like just like your homie. You know, it's like, yeah, I got you. I'll initialize things. That's just that specific instance. But that code, if you were to run it on a different computer potentially, try to compile it there, and that's not, or, or even in the same computer, but not in the IDE, but just directly on terminal or something, it might not initialize things to zero. And then you're in trouble because if you were expecting it to be like, you know, you have a, you declare it into I, you never set it to zero, but you start using it as a counter for a loop because you think it's initialized to zero. You just, you just run with it. And the one time it doesn't get initialized to zero and it's like a negative number, your whole thing breaks down. Maybe it just loops forever or just loops more times than it really should. Because of that, we always want to initialize our variables, right? We do that very easily by saying int x and then equals and then something, right? Zero, whatever. Pointer variables 
can be initialized the same way that you can initialize regular variables. But uh, what do you initialize a pointer variable with? Is the question. Because remember, pointer variables are holding addresses, right? That's that's the reality of things. Is that a pointer variable is holding an address, a hexadecimal address, which again is just a binary address, whatever. It doesn't matter what the number based system is. It's just an address. So if it's an address, what do we initialize it with? And so it turns out that whatever you do initialize it with, it's going to cause problems at the end of the day. So what, as a community, we came up with are sort of two solutions. One of them is, just like with regular variables, you know, with a counter variable at least, you can just initialize it to zero. So you can say, if you have something like int ptr, and by the way, if you're curious as to why I keep saying variable PTR, it's because it's, it seems like shorthand for pointer and it's just a cool variable name. But it could be any variable name. But anyways, uh, PTR can be initialized to zero like this, just like if it was a number. In fact, technically speaking, you could assign manually any address to PTR, but you're going to get a warning if you assign a non-zero address to it. So if I try to do something like PTR gets, uh, let's just say five here, technically speaking, it's going to consider this as address five. So in main memory, wherever PTR is held, which let's just say it's here, it would try to store that there, which technically means if I try to say see out PTR like that, that would try to go to somewhere in memory address five and print that out, which is probably going to end up in a crash or something bad because you're not allowed to access things. So here's the thing about this. It's a good point to bring up as well. The operating system is like the arbitrator of this whole mess called programming and running programs, right? As an arbitrator's job, it, it wants to allow you to use as much memory as possible that it can give you. So like, this is like the community pool of memory, okay? And the community pool of resources in general. So a computer is just limited resources contained in the box, and now they have to be shared amongst all users of the computer, right? And by users, I'm not just talking about like people, but I'm talking about the processes. At one single time, your computer is running dozens, maybe hundreds potentially of processes, okay? And yeah, maybe hundreds now, but dozens, yes. Maybe somewhere like 80 processes, I'd say. Nah, probably less, maybe 50. But yeah, so they all need to share limited resources. Operating system's job is to organize them, okay? And it's 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 a good person, you know? It like, it, it tries to give you all, all, you, all it has, you know? It's, it's not gonna be like, yeah, I don't wanna give you this, I don't feel like giving it. No, no, if it has a resource, it will give it to you with the hopes that you will give back eventually, which we'll talk about later on with the memory leak. But um, essentially, it needs to control sometimes programs from doing bad things. Suppose that address five here was given to a different program. Like maybe you are coding and at the same time you're watching this lecture on YouTube. That lecture on YouTube is a program technically and it's, it's, it, it needs to save temporarily at least. So it downloads from the internet, the video, a buffer of it, stores it in main memory and then shows it to you buffered. That way there's no like freezing, right? What if part of that storage of the information is in address five? And worse yet, instead of just see outing it, suppose that you try to change it like that. Try to assign 10 to it. So I'm trying to put a 10 here like that. This is kind of bad because if that address is being used by a different program and now you're changing it, all of a sudden, like in my face, it's going to get like corrupted because it's, you're trying to put a 10 in there where it's right now representing like an RGB value or something. It's bad, right? We don't want programs to mess with other programs because not only are they going to break their programs, like the, the program that started this, like this program, but it's also going to break other people's programs because now that memory is corrupted. So the operating system limits you on what you can access. It's like, I'm giving you a range of, of memory that you can use and you can use memory that you've requested, but I don't want you to go off digging into other people's memories 
or other programs memories, processes memories, process E, and uh, cause problems. And so it limits you on what you can do. And that's, again, going back to like 219 and 370 kind of stuff. So you will learn more about that. But what this all boils down to is, typically, even the compiler will not let you compile if you try to just directly assign values, like numerical values to memory, like that. You'll get an error. You can get around that error temporarily by using the F permissive flag. But please don't do that. Don't ever... Don't 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 write code that requires that flag unless I specifically state that in the assignment. Uh, if you are, you're probably doing something really bad and not good. So you know, it's like it's, don't do it for a reason, basically. <laughs> okay. So uh, typically, you don't want to assign addresses manually to a variable like this, like fits, like numbers, because again, they change every time. So it's you like you could see out the address of a variable in one run try to manually put that address into the computer for the next run, but it's gonna be different. So it's still gonna access something that's not yours probably, or just garbage basically. So anyways, back to the original reason as to this is, the zero is a way to initialize things. Can, pointer, can pointers be used to hack? So I had an assignment when I, when I was giving out my own assignments that was called crack the ball, because you can use pointers to do some pretty, uh, pretty sneaky things. For example, I can use a pointer to access private variables, like class variables. So if I have a variable that's private in the class, no problem. I can very easily get to it with a pointer. Again, that's why, hopefully I said this, but if not, I'll say it now. Private variables or constants or anything like that are an honest man's security system. It's mostly meant to avoid accidents from happening. It is by no means actually secure because you can use pointers to get around that. Now, as to beyond that, like, for example, if you're thinking like hacking, like, for example, cheating, like cheating in the Warzone or Call of Duty or what well, the same thing or CSGO, that's different because the operating system has active measures to prevent you from accessing other programs as memory. And for cheating, you need to access other programs memory. You need to use an injector for that. That's that's kind of beyond the scope of the course, obviously. So pointers or the concept of pointers, which is the concept of being able to access other memory can definitely be used for hacking and all these things, but not in the way you're thinking where I can just like use the address of operator and the reference operator. No, no, no. The operating system pretty much stops you like hard if you try to do anything like that. For that, you need to go beyond like the scope of programming. You need, like, like I said, injectors or, 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 or things to like, like scan memory for locations and whatnot. So, uh, and anti-cheats will basically monitor that as well. If you're injecting stuff, uh, that's how they detect you and they ban you and you lose your account. Okay, so uh, back to this. The zero is typically used to initialize memory, uh, but it's not good at all to, to kind of ever try to do something like um, this line of code. Like let's say you, if, if, if you initialize a pointer to address zero, it's still putting physically address zero there, which potentially means you could try to access address zero if you try to dereference it. So it's more of like, if you put zero there, it's useful because now you can have an if statement before you access a pointer saying something like if PTR is equal to zero, uh, or, or better yet, not equal to zero, then you can go ahead and like dereference it. Otherwise, you can say something like error. Okay, that's one. That's one way of, of using uh, taking advantage of initializing a pointer and then monitoring it that way to make sure it got assigned to something good. The other option, so one of them is to do the uh, equal to zero. The other one, as your classmate very well asked earlier, is you can use the word null, right? All uppercase like that. And null is essentially the same thing as zero. For all sense and purposes in C++, it's zero. Um, but it's nice because when you see a zero like this, like this line of code here, can be very misleading because you might think this is like a number, but it's not, it's a pointer. So it's so much nicer if you use something like this. Because then you will 100% like automatically know 
that this is a pointer because you're using the word null. Whereas with a zero, it could be like a pointer. It could be just an integer. With this, you're like, oh, this has to be a pointer because why are you comparing it with null otherwise? So, and then again, it's just all uppercase together. No quotes, no nothing. It's, just, it's, a, it's a keyword in C++. And finally, if you are using std equals C++11 or higher, you can actually use another one, which is null PTR like that. All lowercase. And this one has some advantages, which I can't really remember. Um, but uh, it's for most, pretty much interchangeable. But like, again, this has, a, this has some extra advantage. I just can't, I can't think of it off the top of my head right now, but it does. So, uh, yeah, and I have it here. I'll write it down here. So the number zero, is the only number, I'll just abbreviate number like that, that can be directly assigned to a pointer variable. And that is intentionally to avoid weird things like this, okay? And like I said, it's technically possible, but you have to use this F permissive fly. Okay, so um, let's take a quick break and go, well, not real break, but let's take a quick break from the tablet and go to programming just to show you some physical examples of this. Backslash zero cancels null too, right? Uh, okay, so backslash zero counts as null, but that's the ASCII table, which is totally, totally different thing from pointer. A null in the in a, a, a character null, which is a backslash zero, is what you use to terminate a string, like a null terminated string. That's a symbol for when you're when you're when it, when this when a computer is printing out a string, it starts printing out character. At least in the C days, it would print out a bunch of characters. At the end of those characters, the way it would know to stop because it doesn't know the size of it, is it would see that symbol, the backslash zero, which which represents a null. Which is in the ASCII table is, is physically a number. In the I, I, I think it's the beginning of it. It might be like zero, zero, zero. It might be just zero, zero, or zero, ten. Let me see. ASCII table. <coughs> yeah, so just zeros. So literally, a car, if you have a car, and you store backslash zero, and then you see out it as an integer. You would see that just print out zero. So while yes, the word null is used to to represent this, don't confuse it with um, with with null as in terms of pointers. It just they happen to share the name, but they're not not anywhere related. Okay, see just a zero. Whereas if I print it out like an A, it would be like ninety six or something. 65, close enough. <laughs> so yes, but anyways, so let's go ahead and, and, and play with this for a minute. So let's go ahead and just create a variable X, store store four in it, I suppose. Let's create, a, let's create two pointers. Let's call them PTR one and two, or just PTR and then P. Okay, P let's initialize to null and this one does not initialize, okay? So now uh, let's just get rid of this car stuff now. Let's just see out PTR like that. And then this is the same thing for P. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm see outing the constant the pointer variable, which should be null in one of them. And in the other one, who knows? Hopefully it's in the, it, you know, the compiler might initialize it. It did but it doesn't have to. I can't rely on that being the case always, okay? This is the way to be extra safe. This is how you play with fire and crash your program by accident, okay? So, 
let's uh yeah let's start with doing something bad already let's try to the reference after zero and see what happens here we get a very very famous thing that hopefully you guys have not seen yet but if you have my symp my, my my sympathies but now you will see it a lot and it's fact of life and it is called segmentation fault core dumped what this means when you see this in your programs and when you're coding your assignments and you see this it means your program crashed what is a crash it basically means your program was running and ran into an error it could not recover from just a really bad error where it's just like well this is it we are just stopping the program and just kind of giving up that's a segmentation fault the core dump part means that typically when your program crashes to help like developers figure out why it crashed, it will sometimes save some information about what was happening, which is called dumping the core, I believe. So that means I think it's making like a, like a core dump file that you can analyze if you want to see why it crashed. Uh, don't ever do that. I mean, there's, there's other ways to figure out why it crashed, but still, such as using a debugger. So anyways, if you see this, it means your program crashed. Now, why did it crash here? Because I tried to reference PTR, which has who knows what. In this case, it probably has a zero still, but I'm trying to access address zero when clearly I don't have, I, I, sh I shouldn't because that's like beyond the scope of the, of the of the program itself. So that's why the, you know, sometimes the, the, the operating system will stop you, which means it'll sec fault you if you try to access errors of memory that you shouldn't go to. And this is again sort of like to avoid hacking per se kind of it will it'll, it'll just be like nope you're trying to access things that are not part of your program you're messing with other programs no go you know stop crash okay so uh let's go ahead and instead of just having this point to nothing let's have it point to x by setting it the address of x like that now in this case let's see out both the, the reference PTR and then just the address of PTR so we can see where both X is stored and what it contains. So if we run this, we can see that X contains a four when we dereference it like that. And this here is the hexadecimal address of where X lives, which is what PTR holds currently. If I run it again, it's a different address. See that? Every single time it's a different address. That's because every time I run the program, I it's like luck of the draw. The operating system, I'm sure there's some pattern to this a little bit, but most of the time it's just like whatever's available, it just gives you. Uh, I know there are programs that will give you where the sex fault happened, but I forgot which ones. Yes, so GDB will do that. In fact, I'll show you that in a second, uh, how, to, how to do a quick debugging thing. Although I have a video on Canvas already called GDB debugging or something like that. I recommend you all watch that uh, because Debugging a crash can be very frustrating if you don't if you don't if you don't know where to start. And a lot of the times your program would just like, you know, here it's like, okay, I have 10 lines of code, it's a big deal. But imagine I had like 500 lines of code. And then I when I run a program, all I see is this. And you're like, well, I know something is wrong, but like that's it. <laughs> Good luck. And so that that really sucks, right? And so eventually what you want to do is be able to, like you said, identify at least where it's crashing so you can, you can, I mean, just because it, just because a program crashes on a specific line, it doesn't mean that that's the line where the error lies. That can happen a lot, but at least it gives you a spot to start, you know? So I'll show you that since we got about 12 minutes, you know, um, I'll show you that really quickly at the end. So yeah. Okay. So going back to this, we can see that the addresses are different, right? These are hexadecimal addresses. Again, the zero X in front of the address is the sign that this is a hexadecimal address. Okay. Uh, you will always see that it increases in, in, in increments of four because of that. So you will either see a zero there, a four an eight. And then from there, it's a B or, or and that's it, I think. Yeah. So zero, four, eight, and B. Let's see. Nine, no, wait, wait, C, C, not B, C, because it, that would be from A to C is four, right? Because it would go eight, nine, A, B, C. So, yes, I think if I'm doing mad right here. Let me just run a few times. It'd be nice if I didn't get anything but a four. That's very annoying at the end of the force. 
let's just uh, let's just make another variable here. Maybe that'll make it stop going in the increments of like that. Wow. Okay, it just really wants to have a four. Hey, we got a zero now at least. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and just add another variable. I want to I want to show you when it gets to the C. And the compiler is pretty smart. If I don't initialize the variable and I never use them, it probably never even allocates it in memory. There we go. We got a C now. Okay. So you can see those are the, really the only options. You get a zero, a four, a C, or an A. We didn't see the A, but if I throw another variable, we'd see an A. Okay. So um, going back to the other one here, it's important that you understand the difference between these two lines and what each one makes. Okay. Very, very important. This one dereferences the pointer. So this one is accessing the point. This is basically saying what's in the pointer and then accessing whatever that's pointing to, which is whatever X is. And then this one's just printing out the address of the pointer. And again, this is much bigger than my 0x100 example. These are real addresses in memory, which are pretty big. How many addresses? Think about it this way. 16 gigs of RAM, a stick of 16 gigs of RAM. 16 gigabytes, that's what it stands for. Gigabytes is in the order of billions. That's 16 billion bytes. Every four bytes is an address. So divide 16 by four, you get about four. Not about, you get exactly four. So you have four billion potential addresses in your memory stick that you can access, okay? So the number here probably represents somewhere around the, around that. Uh, if, you, if you're curious, here, let's uh, hex to decimal. Google that, you'll get a converter, rapidtables.com. Turns out that that number in hexadecimal is that. Now I gotta put the commas so I can more easily understand that number. So that's in the order of um, hundreds. Okay, that's that's much bigger than I expected. Uh, that is in the order of like billions, trillions. Why is that in trillions? That does not seem right. Um, billions, trillions. Why is that in the order of trillions? I don't know why it's counting like that. That's that. Well, well, I have 32 gigs of RAM, but uh, that's still a bigger address than, than I could possibly hold. So I don't know. I don't know why it's giving you that big of an address. But you can see that this is a pretty big address. Like that's that's that's. Big now, I I I I think that's uh, suspiciously sus suspiciously misleading because we don't have that many addresses. But it's probably because of the virtual virtual addressing versus physical addressing that's doing that. So I will defer that to two nineteen. So yes, but anyways, um, I think that's where I'll stop with pointers for now. So what I to summarize what I've talked about today. Talked about some basic concepts, and then, and then I'll show you the, very quickly the debugger at the end. But first, let me review. So what I did today is I introduced you into a new variable type, which is a pointer variable. And the way that you declare a pointer variable is you start with the data type, integer, float, double, custom data types, eventually classes, which we'll talk about next class. <laughs> then you put the dereference operator, which is the name of the new operator that you learn, which is the asterisk, and then an identifier. An example of that being something like int ptr. So int is the data type. The asterisk means this is a pointer variable, and then the PTR being the identifier. Now, again, the asterisk is known as the dereference operator or the indirect operator, and you use it, other than declaring pointers, you use it to dereference a pointer, which means to go to whatever is contained in the pointer. To the address contained in the pointer, you go there. So that's what you do with dereferencing. The opposite of that is to get the address of a variable, which you use the ampersand operator, which is the address of operator. That one. If you put something like ampersand x, what you're doing is you're getting the address of x. So you're asking it, where is x store? What is the address of x? Which you'll get. Which And those addresses are usually printed out in the computer as hexadecimal versions of themselves. So that's, and, and you see a zero x in front of that as a symbol that is hexadecimal. And that's pretty much what we did. Um, I, oh, well, I suppose it is a good idea to initialize your variables. And in terms of pointers, the only things that you can really initialize them to is a zero, the word null, or null PTR if you're using C++11. What that is useful for 
It's still going to crash if you try to see out something like that, as you saw here. But you can use an if statement to check a pointer variable and see if it's equal to null before you access it. And that's how you know that it contains bad stuff and you don't want to access it, okay? This will come in more useful when we talk about linked list and how we can take power advantage of using null to signify whether it's kind of like the end of the list and so on. So that's kind of a summary of what we did today. And uh, next class, we're going to talk about how to use pointers in classes and I guess the arrow operator, which I thought we'd get to today, but that's fine. And then from there, we are going to talk about dynamic memory allocation. So for the last uh, five minutes, what I want to do is I want to show you a very quick usage of the debugger. So let us go ahead and screw this up by not initializing P or leave actually initializing it like that. But then in here, suppose, you know, normally what you want to say is if P is equal to null, is not equal to null, then you can say C out P, right? That's the whole idea of initializing variables would be pointer variables would be to, to avoid this from being an issue. So this would run just fine. However, suppose I screw this up and instead of making it not equals, I make it equal equals. So now this is going to crash because I'm going to try to dereference a pointer containing zero, which is fault. Okay, let's do a quick lesson on how to figure out where that crashed. The getaway, I suppose, will start is you put a, C, a bunch of C out statements basically saying like C out here. Okay, and you just do a bunch of those and then hope, hope for the best. If you do the getaway like that, I'm going to warn you. Make sure you put that end line at the end of it because if you don't, it may or may not print out like that. It didn't print out there, but technically speaking, it did get to that. If I was to put an end line here and force it to print, then it would have printed here and then it would have crashed. So at least I would have known that it reached that line of code. Alternatively, you can use the word flush, which is the same thing as a, as a line feed. I think I talked about this the other day. Uh, if not, just check Discord. But uh, you can see here, the word here. And so, yes, uh, that's what a lot of people do, but it's ghetto. And uh, it has its usages for something very quick and dirty, but not, not the way to debug, not the way to debug long term. But anyways, if you're going to use that, make sure that you use flush at the end like that or end line. Don't just put a C out statement like that. As you saw, it may or may not print because of the way buffering works. And, the, and uh, basically, with this method, you tell the computer, like, hey, print this when you get the chance. And then the program crashes. And then it's like, well, he crashed. So I guess he doesn't need me to print it anymore. And then doesn't print it. So, or it could just get lucky and print it. So then you're like, you're really confused because sometimes it prints and sometimes it doesn't. And that's just like totally bad. But anyways, that's one way of do, of, uh, of debugging. The better way is with a debugger. Here's a debugger that's already in Sally, but if not, you can download it to your computer as well. First of all, when you compile, add a flag. Flags are like when you do std equals C++11. Another flag that you can also add is dash G. This is the one you want to add. What this does is it builds a version of the program that has more information for a debugger to use. In this case, line numbers, which come in useful in a second here. So how do you run a debugger? You can use GDB by typing GDB and then put in the name of your executable like a.out. Press enter. You see this thing load up? This is GDB. Before we start anywhere, let me tell you how to quit. You got to type the word quit to quit, okay? I tell you that because control C is not going to work. So then you'll be stuck there in Sally and have to like, you know, call Sally manually. So anyways, <laughs> you're running it. Now to run the program and see where it crashes, which is the most basic usage of GDB, which is what we do for now, is you type the word R and then either press enter or if your program requires command line arguments, you could type them here. Any command line arguments you require. So this will be the same thing as doing dot slash a dot out and then put in like your command line arguments like that. Except in this case, you just put R and then the command line arguments. You'll need to put the dot slash a dot out. In this case, no command line arguments. So I'm gonna press R and press enter. When it runs, you're gonna see if it was to run without crashing, it would just finish. And, and, and you actually see the output. In fact, here you can see part of the output coming out, the four right there. The cool thing is here you can see it says program received the signal sec fault. And because it's a dash G flag, not only does it tell us the line, the, the line number, but it actually tells us what that line is. So you, here you can see very precisely that it crashed when it, when it reached this line of code, which is correct because this is when you're actually referencing a pointer that contains zero. 
Uh, furthermore, suppose that you wanted to know how we got to this line, if this was like a line inside a function, inside a function, like you, you call the function that calls another function that calls this line, you can type the keyword backtrace, and that would actually show you a line of the different calls. In this case, it's not, there's only one call which is made, but another very useful command right here. And so this is great because like, this tells me that the, the crash happened at line 11, and line 11 is literally this line, and that is correct. Now, technically speaking, my error is in line 10 because, you know, this is what I messed up, as we said. But at least now I'm looking here and I would be like, okay, why is this crashing? So maybe here you can go ahead and see out what is inside of this. So I could have been like, see out just P to see that. It, and then I would be like, oh, it must be zero. Or you might automatically find it be like, oh, that's right. I, 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 I screwed this up and, and, and meant it to be an equal. Is this on the video on Canvas? Yes, it is on the video on Canvas. It's under like... Uh, Maybe this one? No, not that one. Generic video tutorials. This one. How to use SHCP and then how to use GDU debugger. And, and basically it's, it's like a seven minute video. But uh, I'm doing kind of the same thing that I did here. Uh, now there's more to GDB. There's, oh, hold on, let me stop that. There's there's more to GDB than that. Like you can um, you can use GDB and set breakpoints and variable watches to do like more advanced debugging, which I recommend that you really spend some time learning because it's going to you're gonna you're reaching a stage in programming now where the bugs that you're gonna find are gonna be these kind of bugs that are like finding a needle in a haystack, haystack or haystack. I don't know, but those kind of bugs are much, much faster fixed when you have a debugger that can point you to the right location. And so you wanna make sure that you start early on with good practices to do that. So I recommend that you take the time to set up a debugger. If it's GDB, you can use that. If not, you can use any debugger and learn about variable watch, breakpoints, stepping in and stepping out. And uh, that's pretty much it, breaks and breakpoints, I guess, too. So those are things you could learn in quick afternoon, maybe an hour, maybe even less than that. And uh, yeah, like that will literally like cut hours on your debugging time, cut literally hours. Like when you guys send me, you guys haven't done that because you're starting, but like previous semesters or three or two people, when they send me a, a, a bug, they're like, my program is not working or crashing here. I just tell them run GDB and then tell me what line of code it is. And then usually that pretty much tells us where the error is. And most of the time they're like, oh, I can see why that's wrong. Or at least we can start looking there and then like now we're looking at this much code versus like thousands of lines of code potentially so that's what i recommend so uh yes definitely refer to that later so it's generic tutorials and uh yeah so that's it that's what we have today so uh next class we will continue talking about this again talk about pointers and classes a row operator and then dynamic memory allocation uh which will be a very very interesting topic so uh until then, thank you guys for watching. You guys are very, very quiet today. Thank you, thank you for, for one person that was good, that was talking though. At least I, I know that I wasn't just talking to myself. So I'm happy about that. But uh, make sure you get your assignments done. And yes, you guys have an amazing day too. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. I'll see you guys next class.